to this concluding uh, week of lectures. In this uh, week 12's lecture, I'm going to talk about how the Gothic is accommodated in the realist narrative. I'm going to give you a specific example in Dickens's uh, Bleak House. I'll also be discussing uh, in general about women's writing uh, in relation to the Gothic mode. Bleak House was Dickens's ninth novel and with its double narrative in which chapters are either told from the perspective of one of the characters, Esther Summerson, or else presented from the perspective of an omniscient narrator, it is arguably his most technically accomplished work. It is also the novel in which his use of Gothic imagery to heighten his attacks upon society's failings is at its most intense. Dickens's Bleak House is a mature novel. It has a double narrative. There is an omniscient narrator and then there is uh, this first person narrative of Esther Summerson. Now, these two narrative points of view are representations of uh, Dickens's technical skill in capturing the realist mode. Further, it is also this novel, Bleak House, uh, in which Dickens um, exploits the Gothic mode to highlight the failings in society. In other words, Dickens's handling of the Gothic is used to ascertain the reality, ironically, um, of this kind of narrative. In other words, um, the Gothic is used to reinforce the realism of Dickens's uh, fiction. In particular, in particular uh, the Gothic imagery points to the uh, fractured lives in um, Dickens's society. The opening paragraphs of Bleak House describe London with surreal, nightmarish intensity. The streets are awash with mud, so much so that it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus 40 feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill. Soot from the chimney pots fall as black rain, and everything from the London docks to the Essex marshes, the Kentish Heights, and the eyes and throats of Greenwich uh, pensioners is cloaked in fog. This refers to the opening statements in Dickens's Bleak House. The description is surreal, as Buswell puts it. It is not just surreal, it's nightmarish, it's gothic. Uh, gothic in the sense it is dark, full of horror, quiet horror, quiet desperation. In fact, the narrator, the omniscient narrator says that it will not be surprising to meet with a prehistoric, a primitive monster such as a megalosaurus, which would be huge, 40 feet long or so, and it would be, it would be trundling on the roads of um, this London space, again, this image of a primitive prehistoric monster is befitting the Gothic subtext of Dickens's realist novel, Bleak House. And one can see that visibility is very thin at that moment in the novel. Uh, it's, the soot seems to be like rain, the soot from the chimney pots. It's, it's full of that um, gray matter, the dark matter, which makes uh, it hard for the uh, people to look at the world properly, to see the world clearly. Everything is covered in a blanket of mist. Everything from the docks to the marshes to the eyes and throats of people. So everything is blanketed, enveloped in fog. When you read the uh, second half of this uh, passage, uh, I'm sure you would be reminded of other novels that we have read for this course. Uh, we would be reminded of The Moonstone, 
we would be reminded of um, the picture of Dorian Gray. We would be reminded of the Hound of Baskervilles because of uh, specific references to um, marshes, to the docks, uh, and, and to how everything is enveloped in a suffocating uh, atmosphere. So these are classic terminology, uh, classic ambience that we meet with in Gothic fiction. However, this obscuring of the landscape in and around London is as nothing in comparison with the groping and floundering condition of the High Court of Chancery where the seemingly interminable case of jarndyce and jarndyce drags slowly on. The little fog outside the court mirrors the fog of stagnation generated by the processes of the law within. Now, there are two different kinds of usage of the Gothic in this realist fiction. One is the literal. There is fog in London for a greater part of the time, and this fog is uh, diminishing visibility. It makes everything covered in mist and soot. There is little gloominess, bleakness, and darkness. The other is the metaphorical condition of bleakness, a foggy state of mind both of individuals and of the society itself. Now, the word groping and floundering, trying to find out the idea of seeking helplessly, as if one is in the dark, is the kind of emotion, the state of mind, that people who visit the court of chancery to get justice feel. That is their state of mind. Uh, the Court of Chancery is this Court of Justice where there are plenty of cases, hundreds and hundreds of cases, and everything drags on. The legal processes are so slow that the, um, the that everything seems interminable, unending. The cases are unendingly represented in court. Therefore, this kind of uh, emotion, the lengthy drawn-out processes of um, the legal world, is similar to the fog one finds outside of it on, on the marshy, um, sooty streets of London. So there is little fog and then there is this metaphorical fog and um, there is stagnation, both literal and metaphorical. And um, the processes of law, the judicial system, um, is uh, are represented to indicate the general stagnation of the structure of society. So you can see how um, the Gothic is interconnected with the realist mode in this particular fiction. You can see how the Gothic is accommodated in this um, domestic fiction as well. Dickens uses this method of comparison throughout Bleak House. Time and again, one location institutional character is compared with another. Just as a little fog is contrasted with the mental obfuscation of the law codes, so Chesney Wold, uh, the traditional Gothic country mansion of the aristocratic Lord and Lady Deadlock, is compared with the Gothic slum of Tom All Alone's. Indeed, as Dickens shows, the desiccated nature of the former actually results in the creation of the latter. In a sense, as we see, the traditional Gothic landscape serves to shape its modern Gothic counterpart. Now, there are plenty of comparisons that are orchestrated, set up by Dickens in Bleak House. There is one location being compared with another, one institution with another, one character against another. So there are a lot of doublings, comparisons, uh, duality in this uh, particular fiction. Now, uh, as we saw just now, how the literal fog on the London streets is compared to the metaphorical fog, or the fog of stagnation in the London courts, the court of chancery. That's one comparison that we have just uh, looked at. The other interesting comparison is that of uh, the country house 
with a London slum. The country house is called Chesney Wold and the London slum is called Tom All Alones. Tom All Alones is a symbolic name. Tom is alone. Tom is isolated and Tom becomes representative of a particular section in society, the very poor, the poorest of the poor. And uh, what is gradually becoming clear in Dickens's Bleak House is this point, which is the desiccated nature, the degraded nature, the emptying out of Chesney World, the Gothic house, is resulting in, is directly um, producing structures such as spaces such as Tom All Alone's. So Tom Wall alone in London slum is inevitably connected to the uh, degradation, the destruction of the country house um, logic. So traditional Gothic landscape are inevitably interlinked with the modern Gothic uh, spaces. If only, if only the traditional Gothic structures had been thriving, if only the Chesney world was a very um, living, thriving center of a traditional society, then one would not get places such as Tomwell alone. That seems to be the message that uh, Dickens is driving at in his uh, novel Bleak House. So Lester Dedlock's stately home in Lincolnshire, Chesney world, is a traditional Gothic edifice. The labyrinthine passages inside the building are lined with gloomy portraits. The river which the building overlooks is stagnant. And there is even a hint of the supernatural in the form of the ghost walk, the flat pavement running outside the house upon which ghostly footsteps, if heard, are believed to herald disaster. You have a classic recipe of the Gothic fiction. By now, um, you would be easily spotting all these uh, attributes, these tropes that uh, belong in the Gothic world. For example, uh, the word labyrinthine, the maze-like passage, the confusing passage that uh, makes passerbys, people who traverse that, get lost or, or you know, get confused and that indicates a psychological, you know, uh, confusion as well, among others. Then again, the river which doesn't flow, with the stagnation, there's a sense of uh, being held up. Then further, we have, um, you know, the very word ghost in that uh, walk. Uh, the ghost walk is the name given to that pavement and footsteps are heard. Um, you know, uh, apparently supernatural in tone because once uh, you hear those footsteps and then, then uh, it is believed that something terrible will happen. So uh, the classic ambience of um, the Gothic world is built into Chesney world. Chesney world is emblematic of the dead weight of the aristocracy and the prevailing status quo that hinders any possibility of change. The stagnant river, the lengthy succession of portraits depicting the previous generation of deadlocks, reflecting the resistance to uh, progress of the occupants within. Chesney world's true Gothic significance resides not so much in its appearance as in its anachronistic quality, obsolescence and isolation from the modern world. The key gothic structure of Chesney world in Dickens's novel represents several aspects of British society. It indicates that aristocracy is no longer relevant. It no longer seems to be uh, a key influencer, uh, a key figure uh, in society, aristocracy, aristocracy seems to be redundant. In fact, uh, it's not just redundant, it seems to be a stumbling block. It seems to be an obstacle to better change, to uh, any kind of uh, modification in society. So Chesney world is a dead weight. It, it, it is a, 
uh, blockade in the progress of society. So that's one meaning of this um, Gothic world, one symbolic meaning. Now, uh, the stagnant river, of course, is a clear indication, a symbolic indication that uh, there is no change, there is stagnation. Um, and um, you can connect this with the other marshes, uh, marshes and bogs and, and sinking sand that we uh, saw in the previous uh, novels that we read for this course and the portraits the portraits are a representation of the past the portraits that we see in chesney world are um, representations of the lineage of the deadlocks uh, and they seem to be resisting once again any kind of change now we can connect this with gothic curses you know you can also connect this with um, this problematic gene being passed down um, by these ancestors, genes that corrupt, um, genes that somehow pass on wise. So um, the weight of tradition seems to be uh, a disturbing factor, a factor that um, prevents or blocks any uh, uh, modernity, any uh, progression. Now, Chesney Wells most important gothic element seems to be uh, not just in its physical structure but in the fact that it is anachronistic it seems to be a vestige from the past it's it doesn't seem to belong to this time and age it seems to be obsolete it, it's not as i said um not serving any function in the current society it, it's no longer an economic center Gothic house, I mean, uh, country houses were economic centers. They were the economic pulse of society previously, but they are no longer that. In fact, something else has replaced that, um, you know, economic uh, center, and that is science and modernity and progression and trade. Now, because of these factors, we realized that this kind of Gothic structures have become isolated from the modern world, which is one of the reasons why all these Gothic places many of them are in faraway locales they are marginal to the uh, urban centers um, they seem to be primitive they seem to be ancient they seem to be prehistoric so these are some of the literary tropes through which um, the gothic structure is set up in the novels Tom all alone meanwhile is a london slum that provides a modern Gothic equivalent to the moribund horrors of uh, Chesney World. The main street past Tom All Alone's is a stagnant channel of mud lined with crazy houses shut up and silent. Tom All Alone's provides a refuge of sorts for London's poor citizens, those on the extreme margins of society. Due to its insanitary conditions, however, it is also a breeding ground for crime and disease. In the illustration of Tom All Alone's by Halbert Knight Brown, the buildings encroach on either side while the shadows potentially hide all manner of threats and horrors. Now, Tom All Alone's is a London space. It is not part of the traditional country house special accessory. In fact, it is a contrast to that. Now, um, we had looked at the horrors, the gothic tropes of Chesney world, we have seen how uh, much in decline, moribund means something that is lacking vitality, something that is in decline. So we have seen the declining state of Chesney world, which is portrayed to us through the gothic lens. Now let's look at how the London slum is portrayed. It's once again stagnant, just as the river outside Chesney world is stagnant. Um, it's full of mud instead of waters, instead of that symbol of fertility, that symbol of lushness and health and life. It's full of mud. It's very silent. There's no life to it. Um, now, though this is silent and, and stagnant, this space is also a heaven, a refuge for the very poor, the poorest of the poor and those who belong to the margins in society all those liminal beings find a space to um, survive in this um, london slum not only that uh, 
even though it's a heaven it is also a a breeding ground crown ground a breeding ground of um, not just disease but of all kinds of uh, crime so crime and disease go hand in hand in this particular london slum so here we have a modern uh, landscape of the gothic disease and crime are uh, modern versions of the gothic uh, mode and uh, if you look at some of the illustrations, particularly the illustration of um, Halbert Knight Brown, who is known as Fizz, um, he represented this um, slum for uh, Dickens' uh, novel. And in his uh, illustrations, um, you can see that you know the buildings on either side of this London slum seem to kind of crowd, um, crowd around. They seem to encroach on either side. It's, it's as if it's kind of suffocating all spaces and um, in the in those shadows, in those shadows of the um, edifices uh, of the London slums, there thrive lots of um, you know horrors. While we read this, we are also reminded of the previous East End scene that we saw in the picture of Dorian Gray, where people huddle together outside on the street near the doors and there's horrible laughter and then there's crude violence, then there are brawls. So there is a connection running through all these works in terms of the representation of uh, the street gothic, you know, the slum gothic. What links Chesney Wall to Tom Wall Alunes is Chancery and the labyrinthine legal complexities of the case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce. Tom Wall Alunes is the main location whose fate is caught up in the interminable court case, a case that involves a Lester and Lady Deadlock, the aristocratic Gothic edifice of Chesney World and the squalid slum of Tom Wall Alunes are connected by the political inertia and self-interest displayed by the interminable processes of the law. Processes that the ruling elite have no desire to change because, of course, it suits their interest by maintaining the status quo. Now, this Gothic world of Chesney world is connected to the London Gothic slum of Tom all alone, and that connection is represented by the court case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce. So you can see how this um, traditional upper caste society is interminably linked to the uh, working classes, the lowest of the low in society. And uh, Greg Buswell points out that, you know, there is uh, no change brought upon um, either by the court or by the ruling uh, elite, the powerful, because they do not want to change the status quo. It is safer to uh, retain the status quo and therefore the Tom all alone uh, is a place that doesn't change and neither does the gothic space of the country house uh, of Chesney world. Now we have seen how um, the gothic is used to represent really viscerally um, the problematics uh, in London society and um, the gothic becomes a weapon in Dickens hand to represent very, very realistically uh, the fractures that crisscross uh, his contemporary world. Now, let's turn our attention to the kind of Gothic fiction that are being uh, written in the 20th and 21st century, especially by women. What we're interested in terms of the contemporary fiction is how the Gothic becomes uh, represented and what are the purposes to which uh, uh, the Gothic is put to. Contemporary fiction is urgently seeking techniques for the aesthetic transformation of feminine anger. The rage that is now welling up is an emotion women have traditionally been taught to suppress. In her acute study of British women novelists, a literature of their own, Elaine Shawalter traces writers' persistent problems with the consequences of repressed anger. She insists on a woman's need for confrontation with her own violence, rage, grief, and sexuality in order to free her productive energies. Now, the point here is that there is anger on the part of women writers. There is feminine anger. And that anger is usually suppressed because that's what women are traditionally advised to. Now, the Gothic is a mode that offers a, ch 
channel to express this feminine uh, anger. Now, the Gothic becomes a narrative tool which helps the writer confront her own anger, violence, grief, and sexuality. And therefore, it is very, very helpful for her to uh, make use of this particular subtext, this particular Gothic subtext, this particular Gothic mode to express her creativity, her productivity, her productive energies. On this premise, Freud and the feminists, in spite of their many disagreements, agree. In keeping with the central insights of psychoanalytic thought, women writers today insist on waging the ongoing artistic struggle with form and feeling on their own grounds. All art strives to fashion a voice for experience. Women are now determined that the voice and experience of their fiction and poetry be their own and are rejecting the secondary cultural images that are not grounded in self-definition. Therefore, uh, what is happening with women's writing in general is that uh, they're constantly grappling with the nature of form and how to use that form to express their emotions. And one of the fundamental ways um, through which this particular um, set of associated set of emotions such as anger, resentment, um, the, the suppression, uh, the oppression that they have suffered um, is to kind of illustrate them, express them artistically, creatively um, through, a, through a, a gothic use of that kind of narrative form and structure. Asserting that nurturance and empathy are not, separa not separated from uh, aggressive qualities in an individual, uh, they are discovering their own rage. The feeling now searching for expressive form, however, is not just the anger that was formerly denied to women as part of the normal spectrum or emotion, but an anger frequently intensified into hostility by its long repression. Now, uh, there are a range of emotions and... Um, well, Joan Lidoff points out that while the women are usually associated with uh, nurturance and empathy and acknowledge those um, sets of emotions, they also realize that it is all right to possess this rage and, and um, this rage it gets expressed through particular modes of writing and, and the Gothic easily comes to hand uh, when we try to kind of uh, think how this anger is channeled. Now, let's look at um, certain works which belong to this category of domestic gothic. Um, this work is particularly interesting and uh, it would be great if you could check this out. It is called uh, God, Domestic Gothic, the Global Primitive and Gender Relations in Elizabeth Bowen's The Last September and The House in Paris. Now, the representation of domestic space and its gendered formulations has become an important perspective through which to further our understanding of women writers in the interwar period and their relation to modernism. And as Anglo-Irish writer Elizabeth Bowen persistently shows, it is necessary not only to contextualize domestic space historically, but to read it as a contested site in which men and women, young and old, redefine and conflict over definitions of national and cultural memory and identities. We understand that rage is one particular quality that the women uh, possess but they don't just hang on to rage there are other perspectives um, that emerge uh, in the understanding of women writers as they uh, explore the period between the wars the two world wars and how that period and its expression connects with modernism um, this particular uh, anglo-irish writer elspeth Bowen um, argues that uh, it is important to put everything in the context, the historical, social, cultural context, uh, and particularly she suggests that domestic space must be contextualized. Domestic space is not ahistorical. Uh, it need not be looked at as something which is unanchored. Um, domestic space, according to Bowen, belongs to particular time and period and age and uh, the domestic space becomes a complex um, spatial uh, entity 
in which there are um, conflicts between men and women, there are conflicts between uh, older and younger folks, and it is um, a site which is constantly negotiated. It is a site that is getting uh, uh, defined and redefined, and um, the domestic space is important because um, they are interlinked or connected to uh, discussions of identity and cultural and national meaning. Therefore, um, when one looks at the representation of domestic space in uh, Gothic fiction or in uh, Gothic plots in realist fiction, uh, we need to really uh, pay attention to what that um, domestic space means. What is the function of that domestic space in that particular uh, novel? What are its uh, cultural meanings? What are its national meanings? What are its societal meanings? So these are some of the um, areas in which we can explore. For Bowen, these definitions are complicated by recognitions and denials of the place of those uh, who are deemed ethnically, racially, and culturally other. In turn, the presence of the other creates an unsettling sense of instability, an uncertainty about individual and national identity. Thus, regardless of how insular or stable, domestic space in Bowen's writing is never merely private, but rather always generative of and invaded by the history and politics constituting the public sphere. Now, we have seen that domestic space can be complex as we see uh, as we uh, find in Elizabeth Bowen's writings, this complexity can be further complicated by our understanding that there are um, certain others who do not belong to this domestic space of the nation. Um, they are ethnically, racially, and culturally alien to this space, but they are within the nation. Therefore, um, further ideas of instability and uncertainty emerge with regard to domestic space, uh, with regard to the kind of identities uh, about uh, nationality and about uh, individual identity. So the domestic space is not just the space that we find in the home. The domestic space also uh, makes sense when we think about um, the nation itself as a domestic space. Therefore, uh, concepts of insularity, um, isolationism, uh, the ideas of privilege, uh, the ideas of stability are proliferated in our discussions of this domestic space. And what is ultimately clear is that the domestic space is never private. The domestic space is uh, always already public because um, a domestic space is crisscrossed by cultural and historical traditions and meanings and influences. So um, there are different levels of uh, domestic politics uh, when we look at Gothic fiction. So uh, Elizabeth Bowen, this Anglo-Irish writer, is an um, interesting uh, figure to check out uh, to see how um, various meanings of the domestic Gothic are generated in her uh, fiction. Now, this particular chapter about the last trip to September and the house in Paris is, is a particularly interesting read. Uh, because this chapter focuses on the domestic spaces so important throughout Bowen's work that en encapsulate and reflect Bowen's most central artistic concerns during the interwar period. We begin with the big house in the last September in 1929 and then move on to the urban middle class home, uh, homes depicted in the house in Paris. Uh, the very brief description that you get of this chapter will tell you um, here that there are a range of domestic um, spaces that are being uh, discussed um, in this particular uh, article. Um, we have the big house. The big house refers to the country house, um, the economic and cultural center um, that big houses are traditionally in society, and that gradually changes. And there are, um, you know, proliferation of middle class urban homes, and um, those are. Um, represented uh, really remarkably in, in the house in Paris. So why do the representations change? What are the meanings behind these houses? What do the urban middle class home represent? So these are some of the questions that you can um, ask. And what is the relationship between the middle class urban home and the Gothic mode? So do ask these questions when you read uh, these uh, articles. 
Now let's look at another work. Um, it's titled uh, Women and Domestic Space in Contemporary Gothic Narratives, The House is Subject. Now this is by um, Andrew Hawk uh, soon. And um, it's, it's a fascinating work and it's a recent uh, work that I would like you to check out if possible. At the heart of many Gothic narratives, it's a house, a trope that has remained consistent from its literary beginnings. The title of a work, so often cited as the first fully uh, formed Gothic novel, Horace Walpole's A Castle of Otranto, which came out in 1764, signposts the centrality of a family house within these fictions. Whereas a century of Gothic writing continued to use the crumbling ancestral castle as a site for terror and horror, later work embraced a variety of domestic settings from Emily Bronte's remote uh, moorland farmhouse to Stephen King's contemporary reimaginings in North America. So this is a fantastic way to sum up um, some of the key tropes, particularly the most important trope in Gothic fiction. And you know it already, it's, it's a house. A domestic structure and this domestic structure with its gothic uh, gothic connotations has remained consistent throughout its um, literary uh, travels across time and, and region and, and nations now the castle of Adrando of course begins this um, tradition and what is indicated by this um, recurrence or this consistency of representing a family house is um, the notion that the family is key to the meaning of this particular work. So uh, the family identity is something which is explored through the space it occupies in a structured manner. And uh, we understand that there are plenty of crumbling ancestral Gothic places, houses, and um, the fictions that we have um, read and the fictions, uh, Gothic fictions that exist. And the terror, the terror that occupy the walls of these Gothic um, places, uh, Gothic houses, regardless of the fact whether it's crumbling or not, is an indication that the anxieties and, and um, complexities the family experiences is represented through all these various manifestations of horror and terror that we come across in these settings. And the settings can be from Emily Bronte's, you know, Wuthering Heights, this remote farmhouse that we have um, come across, um, you know, where Heathcliff and, and Catherine, um, you know, express their um, hostilities, resentments and happiness to um, the contemporary work of Stephen King, in, in which um, he reimagines uh, urban settings in a gothic uh, mode. So regardless of the changes in time, one thing is clear, the house and, and its um, presences, be it uh, you know, uh, living beings or, or spiritual hauntings. So these are representations of the problematics that we uh, come across in society. In addition, the domestic space is frequently a place of containment and entrapment, especially for a female subject. Andrew Hoksun Ning directs his uh, focus on this recurrent uh, theme in his scholarly work, Women and Subje uh, in Domestic Space in Contemporary Gothic Narratives, The House's Subject. This would be a worthy examination in itself except that uh, Ning makes uh, a simple change of perspective that shines new light on the study of Gothic narratives. Now, we understand that the house is Gothic primarily because it's a place where people feel trapped, literally, metaphorically. Particularly, the sense of entrapment is associated with a female identity, a female figure, be it Radcliffe's women or um, uh, Bronte's women. So it's the women usually who are found to be uh, victims, who are found to be incarcerated, who are found to be uh, locked up in these um, domestic spaces. And, and there's a great irony in that because domestic spaces are supposed to be spaces that protect, respect, uh, treat women as quote-unquote uh, angels, but the reverse seems to be the case with Gothic fiction. 
and thank you for uh, opting for this course. I hope uh, uh, you make this course exciting by uh, connecting a lot of other texts to the uh, ones that I have uh, chosen for you uh, for this uh, particular 12-week course. Thank you for watching. I'll see you around.